Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 153 of the Meet the Farmers podcast with me, Ben Eagle. Today, I am heading to Cheshire to speak to Tim Dobson, who, with his wife Marnie, runs Chestnut Meats, the UK's largest specialist goat meat business. And it's not often I say that. In fact, I'm not sure we've actually ever covered goats on the show. So this is probably, I think this is a first. Um, they founded the company back in 2006. And before that, he was a dairy farmer for 17 years, uh, producing milk for Joseph Healer, who uh, who make cheese. Um, before we started recording, we're just having a little bit of ch- chat about them. Um, we have, for anyone who's interested, we have covered them over on the, on the Kite podcast, if you want to head over there, um, talking about their Eat Lean brand. Um, uh, Tim sent me his CV, and uh, I mean to read the list of achievements and accolades on it is is honestly it's quite remarkable. He has done quite a lot, so we'll see how, see how long we go on for today. Uh, but to name but a few, he was acting chair of the Association of Dairy Farmers in two thousand and one. From two thousand and four to two thousand and ten, he was a council member for the for the ROBDF, Royal Association of British Dairy Farmers. Um, he was runner up in the Farm Entrepreneur of the Year in 2008. He was a finalist in the British Farming Awards Diversification Innovator category in 2018. And he was also a founder of Tarpoli Farmers Market. So lots of diverse stuff going on there. He's married to Marnie and has three children. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for coming on. Um, how are you doing? Doing very well. It's uh, nice to be asked. It's nice to be here. This is the first for me. Oh, brilliant! Well, it's a thrill for me. Um, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the cows first of all. Um, so, actually, let, let, let's talk about goat because I mean, you sold the, your cows in two thousand and eight, um, but the goats actually came before then, sort of two thousand and six time. So there was a bit of crossover. Yes, there was. Um, we we knew where we were with with cows. We knew. We were a small farm um, that was struggling to grow, and we needed to do something that added value to what where we were up to. Um, we were trying trying to um, get niche rather than get big. So on the back of that, we looked at all sorts of different ideas. And there was a farm sale not far from here, and you know we went and we went to have a look and see what was going on. And Marty bought three goats. Okay. And uh, you know, you think, well, this is a bright idea. We are silaging, and the, the lads that are silaging also happened to be milking goats at the time. And they said, well, three is neither here nor there. And we wound up with a couple of dozen billy goats to, to rear. Okay. And you know, bottle reared them, and we've got some Italian stocking here at the time. Um, and there was, you know, it was as much milk milking a much work feeding these goats as it was milking a herd of cows. <laughs> And we put a, we did, we reared them. Uh, we started to butcher them. We got a local butcher to do them for us. And we put a sign at the bottom of the drive that said goat meat for sale. And you'd watch people drive past. They'd get about 40 feet past. They'd stop. They'd look at one another as if to say, what the heck is this nuts around? <laughs> they'd turn around and buy. <laughs> and, and, and this, this was pre the financial crash. People had got money. Okay. Um, and it worked. Um, and it kind of grew and it kind of grew. Yeah. Um, yeah. And on the back of that, we started making some changes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know your part of the world, um, what's Cheshire like uh, generally and, and farming wise? So we're in the parish of Acton. And in the 60s, Acton used to have the biggest concentration of dairy cows in the UK. Um, Everybody here milks cows. That's kind of what this bit, bit of the world is and what it does. Um, there aren't so many dairy farms now, but there certainly aren't as many cows. Yeah. There's much milk. Um, there's a big range. There's, there's a lot of indoor herds. There's a lot of extensively grazed herds. There's not so many small family farms now. Um, they're all struggling. But, you know, you're still in cow country here. Yeah. Um, nice bit of the world. Plenty of rain, plenty of sunshine, um, plenty of chimney pots, which, if you're selling the short life products such as milk, you need. Um, it's quite a prosperous bit of the world because people can commute from here to Birmingham, to Manchester, to Liverpool, um, to Chester. So you, you get that influx of um, the community, um, which has been quite good around here. Because um, farming communities 
has shrunk somewhat. Tell us about Chestnut Meats and the business model behind it. Um, so in terms of where your goats are being sourced, uh, where they go for slaughter, the butchering process, that kind of thing. So Chestnut Meats was named after the chestnut tree on the front yard. Nice. Um, nothing complicated, nothing fancy. Um, I have a cousin that makes cheese and she has a Federer and an English name. And the English name isn't the best cheese, but it sells far better. Okay. So on advice from her, we, we, we named it Chestnut Meats. Um, we originally started with our own herd of goats. And after four or five years, we realized that actually I wasn't the best goat farmer and there were better goat farms out there. But we were quite good at butchering and running and marketing. Okay. So we developed that side of the business. And, and certainly when Marnie came back from her Nuffield, she stood there and said, as she got off the plane, she said, we need to sell the goats, um, which we did. Um, and we've got a bunch of about 25 farms that supply into us now. Um, and as we were saying earlier, you know, I used to go down to Essex. Um, and I've discovered the countryside. Um, and that's a bit of the job I like dealing with farmers, buying goats, Yeah. Um, you know, and I will go down to the South Coast, I'll go up to the North East, yeah. um, I'll go into the Midlands, Yeah. and it's an absolute privilege to sit there and do a deal with farmers, um, and park yourself at the kitchen table and put the world to rights. Yeah, that's, a, that, that's um, such a good point, actually, because I've, I've been on the road the last week, and I mean, it's been, I've been doing a lot of these lot of these and another podcast well over zoom for obvious reasons the last couple of years and it's so nice to get out onto farms again but also you see parts of the countryside that you just wouldn't see otherwise oh if you end up in herefordshire this time of year with all the apple blossom out yeah. it's gorgeous yeah you know it's it's just beautiful and if you you're going down to dorset and you you go across across the top of the country through wiltshire and it's big, open countryside that yeah. just opened that forever. It's just incredible. Yeah. You know, um, and sometimes if you're going down there, you'll, you'll end up stopping down there. Um, normally you'd stop on farm, but times have stopped in, in holiday lit inns. Um, and you find yourself looking out, you, you look out the coast and there's seven, eight cruise ships parked there that haven't been able to do anything for two years. Um, and it, it's just an opportunity to see different parts of the world, see what goes on. Um, mid Wales on an early morning, you're driving along, there's barn owls flying along next to you. It's, you know, there's worse jobs. Yeah, we live, we, we, we live, we live in quite a bad country, really, don't we? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and, and we, we wound up um, in the middle of lock, lockdown. Um, there would only be me on the road. Um, and we were doing veg boxes as well. So okay. in all honesty, I was out as much as I'd been before. And we had a call from, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, for some meat. Okay. And, and I got a legitimate excuse to go to Wales. <laughs> you know, I was desperate for the police to stop me because I knew full well that I could stand there and say, I'm here, I've got this, I've got a reason for being here. And, um, you know, it, yeah. Yeah, have fun and adventures. You, you, you've got to tell me a little bit more about that story. How, how on earth do you end up getting a contract for I'm a Celebrity? Um, there's a, a decent lad who's one of the runners there that okay. goes out and they go looking for um, strange and alternative meats and different things for the, the challenges. And we're kind of used to that. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we get... Hospitals wanting to get in touch because the urethras from goats are exactly the same as they are in humans. Okay. And they will want to use them to train the surgeons. Okay. So, um, you know, things like that you generally get. Um, yeah. 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 Um, there's newer, fancier businesses that tend to get more publicity than us nowadays. But, you know, we, we started off when we did. Um, kill it, cook it, eat it. Um, and we've, you know, we do a bit with ITV, not a massive amount, um, but it's a good deal and it's a bit of fun. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I mean, you do a you have a hog roast business alongside everything as well, don't you? Yes, we do. Yes, yeah. It's kind of busy at the moment. I can um, imagine. Yeah, <laughs> just a bit. We did we did three over the weekend, and and I'm glad we didn't do this on Monday morning because all you'd have got out of me Monday. It's night. Look, we started off on Friday. Um, we did a after wedding party for a family that had had the wedding 12 months ago and they haven't been able to have the party. Saturday, there was a girl whose son had gone to Australia for two years, was just due to come back and then COVID hit. So he'd been out there four and a half years and, and you didn't need to ask which house it was when you went to try and find it because there were banners and, and uh, bunting and all sorts and yeah. they were so pleased to have him home. Oh, amazing. And, uh, and then... Sunday was um, an 18th birthday party. Okay. And full of farmers. Um, and you find the kids standing there coming, I want choice bits. And, and all the dads are standing there chatting and putting the world to rights and picking at the pig and thoroughly enjoying themselves. <laughs> and, um, you know, I like that side of the job. Yeah. I like people. I like, I like doing that sort of thing. Yeah, no, no that's, that's very clear. I mean, how talking of people and, and sort of uh, and, and that side of the business as well, how were you impacted by COVID? Um, we had a good year, if I'm being honest. Uh, we spent the first two days thinking, what the. <laughs> um, and then most of our meat sold online. And at which point, um, I don't think we've ever been as busy. So, um, that set up um, all the parcels go out with DPD, who okay. are 10 years ahead of where they expect it to be on the back of COVID. Yep. Um, I was going around sorting things. You know, we sold a lot of flour. You know, we were going out buying 25 kilo bags of flour and splitting it up and bagging it up and doing it. Um, what else we did? We, we did veg boxes. Yep. Um, just about knocked the head on the veg boxes about a month ago. Okay. Um, and you know, we were going out delivering to households that couldn't get out and couldn't do anything. Um, and, you know, that was fun. Yeah. Um, um, the meat side was fine. The cafe pretty much got shut down immediately. Um, the shop was still open. Um, and folks quite liked it because they'd come and they'd be the only one in the shop. They'd be reasonably safe. Um, and we managed to avoid COVID pretty much all the way through till November last year. Okay. So, you know, we were very lucky with COVID. It was, it was good for us. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing the, the different stories you hear. Uh, let's talk about dairy uh, because before the goats... Um, you were a dairy farmer producing milk for healers. Uh, do you ever miss it? Yes, I do. Um, I enjoyed it. I identify. If ever anybody said, well, what are you? I'm a dairy You're farmer. You're a dairy farmer. That, yeah. that was yeah. what I am. That's who I am. Yeah. That's a huge part of my life. That's all I ever wanted to be. Uh, we had a flying herd of cows. We had a herd of licorice, all sorts. Um, I. You know, we, we used to buy in all the replacements. Um, I was never really good enough to be breeding. Um, so we used to sell the calves about three weeks old. Okay. And that was, that was, for a guy on a small farm who needed to maximise his milk output, and needed to maximise his income, um, that was the best way of doing it. Um, and it worked, you know. When I came back from college, Dad and I worked together for 10 years. Um, he hit 65, I hit 30, um, and it's right, well, one of us is going, I don't mind which one of it is. Um, <laughs> he retired, we bought the business off him, we bought the tenancy off him. Um, they went 12 miles away, and we get on better now than we've ever got on, which is brilliant, which is what you need. Right. That's important. Um, he moved far enough away that he was close enough to be handy, and far enough that we both had our own lives and our own families. And he'd been gone about a week. I stood there and said, 
will you milk for me? I've got jobs coming out of my ears. No. <laughs> and then he rang back minutes later and he said, I'll do it, but I'll only do it once. Oh, and he great. only did do it once. Huh. Um, but he's, you know, he and mum will be here later on for coffee. Yeah. Um, and he'll ask what's going on and have a nosy round. And yeah. He's happy with that. And I'm happy with that. And it yeah. works. How did... um? How did the farm change uh, or the model change at all between you going back in 1993 um, and you, you leaving in 2008? Um, well, we're still here. We're I suppose so. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. Still, we're still on the same farm. Yeah. So we, when, when we came back, we had 4,000 laying hens. Uh, we had uh, okay. 40, 40 sows um, and pigs and... And on to your milk and cow. Yeah, so it really, really was a bit of everything. Yeah, well, that's what you had to do. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the hens, the sooner I could get rid of the hens, the happier I was. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, it, you know, it, it's the same with farming. Um, you know, if one sector's not doing well, the other sector is. Yeah. You know, and we, we used to rear pigs to butcher when we got going. And, and Monday morning was pig catching day. And Marnie always used to hide out of the way because I never believe the word said it when you're trying to catch pigs. <laughs> you know, there, was, there was a trail of swear words following me around. <laughs> it, it just, you know, these images of Terry Pratchett and little swear animals trailing behind. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, you know, this, this was how we did it. Um, and it's taken a long time to actually get decent handling facilities to be able to catch things and do things. But um, all my staff are used to me running into the butchery and going, I need you now. <laughs> it's a Tim catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, the business was part of uh, Disa Dairy Farmers Limited, which was uh, is a 30 farmer member buying group, and you were a director of that. Um, um, just tell me, a bit that, more, tell me a bit more about that. I was invited to join that by a guy called Mick Hughes, who you perhaps know better as the guy who invented Spread Ah, okay. Uh, right. And we set to, and it was a buying cooperative, so we'd buy a fertiliser through there. And we used to have fertiliser loans that would. Um, you take four or five months to pay for your fertilizer. You buy your fuel there. We had a feed feed deal. Um, as a group, we would work together and we benchmark each other. Um, and it was kind of what you needed when you were a one man band. Um, you needed to brace yourself against um, your colleagues, you know, not so much your neighbors. But you, ne you needed to know if you were doing the job well or not. Um, and it was, a, it, it was good for me. Yeah. You know, we had about eight to nine years as members of it. Um, and it was one of the best things we did. Very pleased with it. And it's still going strong. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a, a good business model. Um, and it saved a lot of farms an awful lot of money. Mm. Um, and if you go around, there's, there's other groups doing the same, um, but they were one of the first, and they were daft enough to say, would you like to come and join us? <laughs> <laughs> Your farm itself, um, you were tenants for many years. You bought the farm in 2017. Um, take me back to that, that sort of time, that day. How, how did that feel? Oh, I can't begin to describe it. Um, so we'd started off, Tenant farms on 90 odd acres um, on a three generation tenancy that mum and dad had taken on the day they got married. Um, so dad was only born across the fields. Mum's not from a farming family at all. We took it on in 2000. And as the core business moved away from agriculture, um, we looked at it and said, you know, we're not entirely comfortable with this. Um, we're feeling a little vulnerable. It's not quite right. It's not just as it's doing. Um, I've no great desire to go out and be investing a lot of money on somebody else's property. Yep. Um, and we got on well with the landlord. And 
and I make a point of still doing so. Yeah, yeah. And we still rent some land off him. Um, however, um, we'd watched, particularly the leading Hume farms around here, stand there and go, I want the farm back and do a deal with the tenant. And we looked at it and went from the other end and said, look, um, there's a value in this tenancy. If we surrender it, can we buy um, this? Okay. And, and the, the site had always been, we'd, we'd a set of big Georgian farmhouse and a set of modern farm buildings that were 400 yards apart. And we'd always cursed having two different sites. Okay. Whatever you wanted, you at the wrong site. <laughs> and we looked at it and said, right, well, we'd like to buy the dairy unit. And about that time, permission queue came up. And you could convert an existing farm building into a house. Okay. So we did the deal and said, right. look, if we can get planning permission, let's, let's fix the price, let's organise the deal. Um, and it took about four years to persuade him to get more. Wow, okay. We put him for planning permission. We get it immediately. And then it's, oh, heck, what have we done? <laughs> like, Got to do it now. Thing, what have we done? So we then stand there and we've got two years in the farmhouse while we get sorted. Okay. Having got permission from the house, we then go out and get planning permission to put the butchery in right. and build that first because that's the thing that generates the money. Yeah. Um, and there'd, there'd been a group of guys down in Kent who did modular buildings. Okay. And I'd had their advert that had on the wall for the last five years and yep. up. Yeah. And he comes and looks and says, you don't want to do this, you want to do that. And you've got to <laughs> the price of the cost of the builder. Wow. And it turned up on one morning on a 44-foot Arctic lorry driven by a... Where was he from? Out from Eastern Europe. Okay. And, and it was too big to take, get into the yard. So <laughs> it was one it over the hedge. <laughs> and put it in the field. Um, and then and some of these sheets were, you know, everything was done in multiples of six metres, there were some 12 metre sheets. Yep. So, you know, this was seven o'clock in the morning, I had to knock one of the neighbours out of his milking parlour and say, come on, I need your load all now. <laughs> and we're precision unloading this wagon with two load alls. So we get that. We then have to go get a trailer and get it into the shed that we're in now. Yep. Um, and we stood there and said, look, if we provide the beer and the food, <laughs> Will you provide the Labour family? I think that's, so that's a pretty August good deal. Bank, August bank holiday weekend. <laughs> um, admittedly, first man on the yard was my father. And we'd have these sheets and you'd, you'd take the plastic off. It was like a big Lego kit. In three days, family and friends had managed to build this. Um, it took a lot more doing to do everything, but the mechanics of it were, were good fun. And then we opened up in 2018. Had a good year, managed to kid the bank on to lend us the money to build the house, which scariest, hardest <laughs> bit we've ever done. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I mean, what, I mean, what was that like as a project? Um, you want to do what? <laughs> Your business is what? And you expect me to lend you money to build the house on what planning permission? And <laughs> how does it work? You must be mad. Go on, bugger off. <laughs> um, and I don't, I think we've been rejected by pretty much every bank in the UK. <laughs> and we then had our, our bank manager, who knew about the project all along, didn't manage to do it at all. It was about as much help as a job of kettle. Um, and we then, oh, how did it work? We rang up the, the boss of HSBC Agriculture and told him what we thought about him one day. <laughs> and um, to be fair I wish I'd been applying the wall for that <laughs> oh, look he, he sent a commercial bank manager over and who had no idea of agriculture no idea what was going on but got us the money wow um, and he stood there and he said if you jump through these hoops I will lend you the money and we did and, and he did and, and he came and you know, he was part of the build and climb up on the roof and have a look at an inspection. Wow. And, and when he'd done 18 months standing in for an agricultural bank manager, 
he breathed a massive sigh of relief and went back to the moon. <laughs> I bet he did. <laughs> you blame the poor lad. Um, and, and, and we didn't get it on the first hit, but we got it on the second hit. Okay. Um, so that, that was, I think I aged 10 years in 12 years. Um, building it was quite easy because um, what we got was permission Q which means that you can take an existing agricultural building and convert it into a dwelling. Right. And they'd had one or two had tried it round here and had failed and gone to appeal. Um, and when we came into the, the area, the, the local councils had stood there and said, do you know what? Um, we can't find a reason to refuse this. Um, so that had worked and we'd got we, our architect, I'd literally, he goes past here to work every day. I'd flagged him down. It was pretty much designed on the back of a fact packet. Um, you know, this had been through the design and design before we put it on paper. And it said, here you go. Um, make this better. Um, and he did a very, very good design and access statement. And I believe to that day, this day, that that was the thing that got us Okay. build um we had a group of scouts build the house who were brilliant i'd recommend them to anybody um and then covid hit wow um, and we got the windows in but we got no door so <laughs> we had tiny sheets as the door um and you know how i mean we are 50, 60 feet from the road, everybody can see what we're doing. <laughs> and they all drive past like this with a head over. <laughs> That's brilliant. And when we finally got a door in, and we've got a round roof on here. Wow. So we had the steel from British Steel to put it up. Right. And um, we had a group, group from Merthyr Tidville come to, to bend it. We turned up with this thumping great big generator. And the Welsh lads would go, come to me and say, I can't understand the word those scousers are saying. <laughs> and the scousers would say yeah. exactly the same. <laughs> and they'd bend these sheets, they'd put them up on the roof, they'd go, well, that's not quite right. Bring them down again, bend them again. And then once they got the recipe, they'd do it. And, and it worked. And we now have the, you know, when you're saying, come and find us, we're the house with the round roof. Um, you know, and it had had a red roof when I was a kid. It had a replacement roof as a green roof, and now it's got a blue roof. Uh -huh. And they said, come and choose the colour, and you pick colour. And he said, well, it's two shades away from the standard colour. The standard colour's half the price of that. So we had the standard colour. Yeah, perfect. I was going to say. Um, and, and having gone from a, a, a Georgian house that was designed for making cheese, and, you know, big cold rooms and little windows. I've got some massive windows. Yeah. And it's a big lighthouse. And we used six inch blocks um, to insulate it. So it takes no heating. Fantastic. Yeah. No draft. There's not a single draft in the house. It's wonderful. <laughs> from one, yeah. from one extreme to the other. Never go back. Um, um, let's go back a few years. Um, tell me about your life growing up and, and I'm interested in uh, whether you're one of were you, whether you were one of these kids who always wanted to go into farming or the opposite. Desperate to farm. Um, any excuse to be with dad now for farming and doing. Um, any excuse to go to the auction with him and I was there and I was doing. Um, always wanted to be a part of it. Um, and I had a brother who was the exact opposite um, who stood there and said, it's not big enough for the both of us. Tim's desperate to do it. Um, I'd avoided it like the plague. And um, so, yeah, des desperate to farm. Um, all, all I ever wanted to do was come back here and farm. Yeah, I was going to say, do you, um, do, you, do you get on well with your brother? Um, reasonably, yes. Yeah. He runs the breath testing and anonymity unit at Tala Hospital. All right. Outside Dublin. Wow. So, you know, we never got to see him during COVID. Um, you know, he's he's got a he's built a, a good life for himself out there. Um, doesn't come back home very much. 
yeah, he's a good lad. Um, so before you went back to the farm in 88, um, you went to Harper um, to do an HND in agriculture, during which you did a placement on a farm in Worcester. Um, tell me about the placement, your time at Harper and, and how that set you up for going back home. Harper's been very good to me. It's opened a lot of doors. Um, and looking back, it was a brilliant thing. But I never desperately enjoyed the time there. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed placement. And I worked for a guy called Jim Appleby in the Vale of Evesham. Um, lots of cows, lots of arable. The, his father had come out of the Camel Corps with nothing after the Second World War. And when I went to work for him, he was farming a thousand acres um, and making a good job of it. Mm. Um, I'm still in touch with Jim now. Oh, from nice. about a month ago. Um, I have a lot of time for him. It's a good setup, a nice family. Um, and I learned an awful lot. You know, um, we were up by Long Larting Prison. So we had land near the prison to, to go and cart bales off and do. And, you know, some of the lads would stand there and say, well, you're a miserable bugger, Tim, you never <laughs> wait, you're going fast. And I'm thinking, I'm coming down the hill, having lived on Nuffields and 50 horsepower tractors, driving this big 77 Ford and thinking I'm God's gift dragon coach. <laughs> Knocked this thing out of gear, couldn't get it in gear. I'm heading for the prison gates of the rate and knots, hanging no. on to the tractor for dear life. <laughs> And they're going, why aren't you waving? Thinking, <laughs> you're not allowed to break. Oh, it was terrifying. Uh. <laughs> oh. um, and, you know, Stratford on the Avon Young Farmers, um, the nicest bunch you could hope to meet. And um, I got to see a different bit of the world. Yeah. Um, you know, very happy down there. Yeah. And um, probably one of the best things I've done. And when you come back to look at Harper, um, when Jones was there, when I was there, okay, and you can go for 10 years and not see him, and he'll walk around the corner and go, hello, Tim, how's Marnie? Grace must be at university by now. Um, and a real wow. super superman. So, um, you know, Harper, Harper looking back has been very good to me. But I was a very young, naive student there. Yeah. And, um, do stuff quite differently if we were to go back a second time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, if, if only, if only we, quit, if only we could do the same thing twice. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Nuffields uh, because both you and, and Marnie have done Nuffields. Um, you did yours in 1997, um, which was on cubicle management of dairy cattle. So, um, yeah, I mean, what's so, what, what, what's life like as a Nuffield um, after your scholarship? Because I mean, it's a great network of people in ag, isn't it? But, but tell, so tell me about the scholarship, but also tell about um, life after it as well. So I didn't know a great deal about nothing at all. Um, and I knew that Jim had done it, and I knew I needed a challenge. Um, and I, I knew that, you know, I'd been looking for something like that. Um, so I applied. And at the time, we just put a new shed up, and we were just organising cubicle housing and doing, and it was a topic that, you know, I got the planning permission, I designed the shed, we built the shed. Um, it fascinated me. I think we'd been to every farm walk known to man, picking ideas and looking and doing. So we did this. Um, I applied for the Nuffield. Um, they had a practice interview. Um, and Alad Griffiths did this, the poultry farmer from Shropshire. And we stood there and looking and talking. And the first question is, you know, we award you the Nuffield. Uh, you go off, you, you have a weekend off in New York. Um, you go up the Empire State Building and you get stuck in the lift. Who would you like to be stuck with? Great. Oh, I'm standing there with my jaw hanging. And what a damn silly question. <laughs> and not a clue. Yeah. Um, go home and we sit there around the kitchen table, my brother and I, and we discuss it. We have a good yeah. two-hour discussion on it. And I'd never done interviews. And my uncle was the vicar. And he offered to do a practice interview. Oh, okay. with I was going to say, a great person to do it with, I reckon. Ah, oh, so here's me. And we've got 
my uncle and the parish worthies leaning out of the bedroom window thinking, is he sweating in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when they decided I was in a big enough tears, they wheeled me in and gave me an interview and scared the living world out of me. <laughs> and, and at which point I then went down to London for the interview. And a friend of mine was getting married and his sister was down there. And um, stopped there, stopped the night down in London. Walked into the interview, spent half an hour talking to the receptionist, was very relaxed. Twelve people in the interview. The first question was, who would you like to be stuck in the lift with? <laughs> Funny that. Elvis. They started laughing. I started laughing. <laughs> and I got, the, I got the scholarship within the first two minutes, I Fantastic. swear. Yeah. Andy Dyke followed me in for the interview. Um, he reported later, all he did was 20 minutes worth of laughter. <laughs> and, and, and you had got it. Yeah. Um, I think I was the first person in Cheshire to get in that build. Oh, really? I was okay. really quite just about. Well. Um, and we were, then went off and went to Eastern Europe, travelled out to the Czech Republic to look at farms, um, to look at options. Um, back Czech, Slovak, a bit of East Germany. I wound up on a farm in Czech Republic and the girl whose farm it was had been kicked off by the, the Nazis. She'd got the farm back. She'd lost it again to the Soviets wow. when they came back in. Um, she'd got it back in the Velvet Revolution. She didn't want it. No, she wanted it, but her son didn't want it, but her grandson did. Okay. But she was farming, farming this and she'd got a herd of her about 100 Holstein Frisians inside all year round. I mean, you'd have been, anybody would have been proud of this. They were a super, super herd of cattle. Um, and off we go, and it's fine. And two days later, she rings up and she says, um, my husband's just retired as the director of a brewery. Do you fancy a day out with him? <sighs> And my field had said to me, if all you do is study cows, we've wasted the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you get the chance, don't or don't over-organise yourselves. Yeah. You know, put three or four appointments in a week and, and see how it goes. Yeah. And we go. And his mate, his mate, it was the cellar master. So he says, come on, we'll go down there. And they've eight miles of cellars. And most of it's in stainless steel. Except outside this guy's office where there's three 3,000 litre um, oak barrels. And there was a 16-year-old lad translating for me. And he and I both thought we'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> and every, every so often, one of us would go out with a copper jug and, and fill these things up. We were doing very well. <laughs> and um, they then stand there and say, look, there's, there's an Englishman here today. Do you fancy meeting him? You know meet anybody yeah and um it was the queen's cousin the, photog the photographer <laughs> and i stood there and he's going down the line and being introduced and um good afternoon sir <laughs> what are you doing here I'm studying dairy <laughs> and it was just magical you know yeah. um and Marnie stood there and said, you know, if I get a chance, I'll come out and see you. And I get a letter saying, you know, I will land at Prague Airport here. So she did land at Prague and, and me, who'd driven halfway across Europe in a battered old Daihatsu four track, <laughs> met her there. And Marnie's thinking that she's going to have a weekend in Prague and we might do the opera and it's going to be very civilised. <laughs> and I'd been done a bit of work with the guys that run the, um, the hops. And okay. One of the lad that was taking me around, his, his father was secretary to the hop society. It's our, it's our dance. Make sure Marnie brings you out to time and both of you come to the do. And we did. And the first prize in the raffle was a wild boar that had been shot that morning. It was on the stage. It looked straight out of Asterix. <laughs> and fine, we do this. We, we then go to look at a collective farm the following morning. And this was grand, you know, and he said, well, what are you doing for the weekend? Well, we don't really know. He said, 
take her to Karlovy Vary. It's a spa town. Um, and nowadays it's been taken over by the Arabs and the Russians, but okay. then it happened. And you could go and you could do the 12 spas and then the Bekharov, um, which is like a blow the back of your throat off. It's yeah. 13. So you go around, and this is February, and we're looking around these and we're doing them, and it's bloody freezing. <laughs> Time for a spa, and I says, I'm going in there. Marnie goes, she said, you can't go in there. The sign says no clothes. I don't care. I'm going in. At least it's warm. So she's a thousand miles away from home. Doesn't know where she's going. There's not much of a towel, but it's wrapped very tightly around her. <laughs> And, and every time she goes out to the plunge pool, she comes back and she sits a little bit higher up and a little bit higher up. And I twigged at this at all. And it's, ah, well, there's a far better view from up here than there is from <laughs> <laughs> um, So, uh, you know, we then come back and I go off to, um, where, where did we start off? Wisconsin. And it was all big farms. You know, different world entirely. Um, and from there, I had the opportunity to go to Canada. And Wisconsin, you stop in the hotel and you turn up on the Friday night and they say, right, we'll see you Monday morning, sort yourself out for the weekend. Off you go and do. Um, and I rang Nuffield, Canada up and said, well, where do you suggest? And the boss wasn't there, but his brother answered the phone, who was also in Nuffield, and said, right, you're stopping with us. Okay. And um, I did. And they've been here, and my family have been there. And Howard and Olive are two of the most wonderful people I know. Um, and I got to see all sorts of different farms around Ontario. Fantastic. Um, and then the final visit was Arizona. And, you know, I'd have gone there immediately. It was, it was wonderful. Um, and if you were lucky, you'd have a farm, you'd sell it, as Phoenix grew, you'd sell the land for building and you'd move further out. And if you were lucky, you could do that twice in a lifetime. Okay. Um, different attitude. They were milking cows 23 hours a day out of 24. Wow. Um, I was work, working with United Dairymen of Arizona. And they kind of got the measure of me, but they didn't really know who I was or what I'd got. And they said, well, what is this? And I got back to Stephen Bullock, who was the director of Nuffield at the time, and said, would you send me something? And he'd faxed out a history of Nuffield. Um, well, I got into the, the office at eight and everybody else was in at six in the morning. And they clearly read this. And, and they described it as the best written piece of English grammar they'd come across. Huh. And all of a sudden, doors opened. Yeah. And all of a sudden, life got an awful lot easier and I got to see a lot more. Yeah. Um, and we came back, we presented at Durham the, the following autumn. Um, and as I came off the stage, I was offered two jobs. And wow. having never been offered a job before in my life, that was quite a moment. And, and at that point, you realised, actually, I can go out and do this, and we can do it. And that was a, as big a change as any as I've had in my career. I mean, I've I've um, heard I've heard quite a few Nuffield stories, but honestly, that there are a few more than this. That if if anyone listening is inspired to do one, this is definitely one of those. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I'd worked on dairy farms. I'd worked in the UK. I'd sat my final exam at Harper in the morning, and I'd milked in the afternoon. Um, Nuffield was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, and then when we'd finished, they stood there and said, look, um, you're not an ex-scholar, you're a scholar. Your scholarship hasn't even started till today. One of the events, I was very lucky, I got a Trahane scholarship. And Trahane used to do a, a, an annual dinner down at Simpsons in the Strand. And it was free for scholars. And there used to be seven or eight of us would get on the train at Crew Station. And... Um, you get down there and there's a guy called Richard, 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 Holland, Richard Holland, who used to be involved with dartings and cattle breeders, who's led generations of dairy farmers astray around London and showed them all the spots and all the night. <laughs> and, 
do you know, there was a stage when you were doing this, you'd go to the pub in London more than you'd go to the pub at home. And you got to know London and you got to know the industry. And particularly at that point, all the industry leaders would go along to it. So you, you, you know, you, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be mixing with the, the movers and shakers of the industry. And, and particularly when we were trying to organize the milk protests and the likes, that was a really good um, place to be. Um, so, you know, Nuffield's been very kind to me. Drahane's been brilliant. Um, and you just wish you had time to do a bit more now. Yeah. I mean, without, without thinking of it too deeply, do you mean, how do you think it actually impacted on you personally as well um, in terms of your own personal growth? Massively. I'm very young, very naive until then. And when I first got my Nuffield in, interview, you know, Trahane stood there and said, come down, let's, you know, we come to the Farmers Club, come and have a bite to eat. Um, we want to tell you what you've got and where you're up to. Um, on the Saturday, I went out with Marnie for our first date. Um, and I said, look, I'm going to London on Tuesday. Nine o'clock Monday morning, she said, um, hang up, she said, I've altered the schedule. I'll meet you in Leicester Square at three o'clock. Well, I'd never heard Leicester Square and I'm standing there. Thinking, How on earth am I going to find it here? <laughs> and I would had a cup of tea with my cousin down there that morning who cursed me uphill and down Dale for not telling her that I was going to meet a girl <laughs> in London. Um, and so all through this Nuffield journey, Barney was a part of it. Yeah. So we were courting then. Um, we got married while I was doing a scholarship. Um, and it, it changed me. Yeah. Um, made me a better person. Um, gave me a perspective that I'd not had around here. I thought everybody milked cows. And I found that everybody didn't milk cows. It was, it was quite different. So um, an adventure. Great story. Thank you for telling us. Um, let's let's return back to your business. Um, challenges, opportunities moving forward, where you are at the moment, where you're going. Uh, what's the future look like for Chestnut? Um, the best thing we do is sell meat online. Um, we have customers down in the southwest, London, in Scotland. Um, that's the best, best thing we do. Um, same as everybody else, cost arising. Um, it's a, when, I've, when I've finished with you, I'm going buying cardboard boxes. <laughs> I'm like, God, just, you so, you know. sound like my dad. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what he spends most I'll, of his time I'll take doing. That as a compliment. You know, Amazon, <laughs> Amazon, God bless them, have gone out and bought the paper mills. Never mind anything else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so that's the challenge. Finding staff is a challenge. You know, if we get them, we can keep them. But it's just, you know, we're quite a rural location. They've got to be able to drive here. Um, so building a team is the most important thing we can do. Um, I can butcher, I'm not bad, but you'd never employ me as a butcher. Um, it's my job to keep those guys busy, yeah. to keep running in front of them, to keep stock in front of them, to keep the orders coming in. Um, so there's a lot of variety. Mar Marnie and I run it together. She tells everybody what to do and, and we all do it. And, you know, that, that works. She runs the butchery side of it, I run the farming side of it. Okay. Um, and then we both go out and help one another with what we do. So challenges are to grow it. Um, we had a, a really good COVID. If we can keep that level of growth up, I'd be delighted. Um, I would say we've had a far better year in this year than we did pre-COVID. We're not quite at the COVID levels at the moment. Um, the challenge is to keep, to keep that growth going. Uh, we've got a niche that the supermarkets aren't in. Um, and, you know, I don't think they will come in because there's not enough goat out there to supply um, okay. on a regular basis. We're not the only ones who do what we do. Um, there's some good businesses out there, um, but we tend to do exactly what it says in the box. Um, and we, we know 
what we're doing. We know how to get the product around the countryside to customers. Um, we know which farms we're going to deal with. You know, there are we deal with some of the biggest farms in the country. Um, we also deal with farms that you get half a dozen kid goats off once a year. And there's times when you really, really need those half dozen kid goats. You know, so they're the most important bit that we do. Um, we sell some Spanish goat. Okay. Um, traditionally, that's been cheaper than the British goat. So you, you sell to a market there that probably can't afford to buy British goat, um, which in all honesty is usually the, the Caribbean market. Um, but we're now finding that Spanish guys are selling a lot of goat out to um, Arab countries. Uh, their prices are going up. So that's going to be a challenge. Um, and the challenge for us now is to make sure that we pay farmers a price that's competitive, that consumers can afford to, to buy. Um, because if we don't manage that, they will go off and buy, well, I would say beef, pork or lamb, but really um, the competition is chicken. It is, isn't it? Um, you know, that really is. That's the deep protein of choice. Yeah. Um, but when you're looking at selling to ethnic customers as we do, and you think there's 10 or 12 million ethnic customers in the UK and their go-to meat is goat. We sell a lot of meat diced on the bone. And if you're selling to Indian consumers, they like it in really small pieces. Okay. Um, and to North African consumers, it would be the same. The further down to Africa you go, the bigger they like the pieces. That's interesting. If you go to somebody from Tanzania or to South Africa, they like it in three, four inch cubes, big pieces of meat. And if you send them small pieces of meat, goodness me, you get into trouble. Wow. And that's a perfect example, isn't it? Of just knowing your customer. You've got to be aware of where they come from. Yeah. Of what they want and how they want. Marnie's been out to Hong Kong. Okay. And watched them slaughtering goats on the side of the road. Um, they would have them and eat fresh that day. Um, and Whereas you and I would, for instance, take beef and hang it for at least three weeks. Yep. You know, the fresher it is, the happier they are. Um, and the adults are from out here have got used to me. Yep. They all think I'm as mad as a box of dogs. <laughs> but, you know, I keep turning up every week with animals to go yeah, to exactly. Um, and at the moment, abattoirs are quiet. Yep. And my dad of the business. Yep. Um, so your business is very welcome. Well, I hope so. Mm. You know, and there, I like that side of the business. Um, you like going out and dealing with... If you go somewhere and there's an abattoir that you've not been before, and they stand there and say, go and have a wander around, see what you see, you know there's nothing to hide. Mm. Um, not every abattoir offers you that. Um, they're all going out doing a business the same as you and I are, ch chasing, chasing business, chasing work. Um, and it's a different side of the industry entirely. Mm. Um, the advantage is, you know, it was carcass judging for young farmers the other day. Um, eldest one won a class and the youngest one was second. <laughs> right. and, um, and we stood there and we'd looked at the carcass judging and, and I brought them into the fridge and I told them this, that and the other. And one of the, the butchers had stood there and he said, that's the one you want. He said, that's the pig that looks like Kim Kardashian with a big ass and a narrow way. <laughs> Great. Like, do not go before the master judge and say that. Brilliant. <laughs> well, you know, this is what we do. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness! There are so there are so many things I want to ask you about, but I, I'm conscious of time, so we will start wrapping this up. Um, we're going to end with the two questions that I always ask any everyone at the end of the show. The first is, if you have a message for the public, any message, what would it be? Um, farmers, are good guys. We're good at what we do. We like what we're doing. Um, come and have a look at us. Come and see what we're doing, um, and come and buy. Because if you don't buy us, we haven't got a business. And it's got to be right for you. And there's a lot of good people doing a lot of hard work to make sure that the products are right. Um, don't buy British because it's got a flag on it. Buy it because it's a quality product. 
And finally, a message for your fellow farmers. Don't be fretless. Don't be afraid of taking a chance. Um, go out there and do something different. Go and enjoy it. We're only here once. Um, go and have an adventure. Oh, I think that's a great message to leave it on. Um, we will leave it there. Um, but oh, thank you so much, Tim, for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. And like I say, uh, my, my, my list of questions is, is still going on. So I'm, I, I may have to ask you back and for, for a future episode, but it's been brilliant hearing your story, especially about your Nuffield trips and, and how that shaped you as a person. Um, I hope that's inspired lots of people. Uh, I know it's inspired me and uh, good luck for everything moving forward because I'm, I'm sure that you still have lots of things ahead of you. There's a lot going on here. Thank you very much. It's an absolute privilege to be asked to join you. Oh, thanks, Tim. Thank Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Please do subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform you are listening on. uh, If you haven't already, Um, that will mean that you won't miss any future episodes. And if you're feeling really generous, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review. Um, That also helps in pushing the podcast up the podcast list. So more people, more farmers can hear about it. Um, Or you can always give it a plug on social media. Next time, um, I will be heading to Shropshire. Uh, to speak to dairy farmer Andy Farrow. Um, So I hope you can join me for that. I'm Ben Eagle. This has been Meet the Farmers and I hope you have a great week ahead. Drink only organic milk. No, I'm joking. (laughs) (laughs) It's fair. Um, uh, (laughs) I'll get a lot of backlash off that. I mean, you definitely would. Probably not the not the wisest of messages.